The Hiawatha Wood Turning Club normally meets on the first Saturday of each month. At those monthly meetings, the club tries to put on a quality demonstration for the benefit of its members. At the October 2012 meeting, Steve Promo did a demonstration for the club members. Steve Demo was on his methods for turning a lampshade. This is a recording of that demonstration. But I, I fell the spruce tree at my house the other day, so we're turning spruce today. Spruce is white, and it's fresh felled, and it's green and chirping. It'll make the place smell better than the sewer grinders. So uh, we're, we're going to turn spruce today. Um, this, this one I have a 100 watt bulb in right now. I'm a little concerned about the heat, so I'm not going to leave it on. I normally have one of those corkscrew little fluorescents in here, and it sits in the living room. And when I first put it out there, I was even quite concerned about the heat. So I just drilled a series of holes in the top to let the heat out. And that's worked pretty well, up to 60 watts. It's, it's done pretty well that way. That's the interior. Um, it was just turned right off the tool. It wasn't sanded at all. Um, now you notice this has got the post on top. Um, some lampshades have like a little clamshell that just grabs the bulb. That's what I would suggest for small um, uh, lampshades if you're going to turn them. This is a little turn finial, a cherry finial. And there's also, if you, if you can find old lampshades which are thrown out all the time, you can rescue these out of the inside of them. And I see no reason you couldn't put three little dabs of bathtub caulk and glue that into your wood shade and it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but the little clamshell ones you'll find from the real small wall ones. Um, I haven't turned much lately, and uh, so I did a little practicing yesterday just so that I made sure that I could do this demo. And I identified a few supplies out of a block of spruce like this. To save time, we've used up some time with club business here. I roughed one out in case we ran short of time. So instead of starting with a block like this, I'm going to start with one that already is part way toward lampshade. But this is the one I turned yesterday out of spruce. I'll turn my light up here. They're kind of pretty. And when I was all done turning it, I took a Dremel and I just uh, made the wood a little thinner in the form of a dragonfly. On the inside? Outside. Uh, you, you, thin, you put that on the Yeah, outside. I put it right on this very bulb and I just took the Dremel and etched away until I got well, I was chickened out. <laughs> if, I, if I got any thinner, I'd probably cut through. Which I even thought about drilling two little holes for the eyes, drill all the way through tiny little holes. But you could, uh, I know um, Tom's in piercing. Uh, you know, he's got the dental drill and all that stuff. I, I think he could do some really interesting pieces, lampshades like this. And there's a guy, um, I believe he's in Kentucky, and he turns uh, tulip poplar. And he's quite well known for lampshades. And there's a guy in Kentucky who turns cowboy hats. And he's pretty well known for that too. Ramsey, I think is his name. Jamie Bounds. You know him? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's... Uh, oh, Ramsey? Ramsey, I think. He does the lampshades, doesn't he? I think he does cowboy hats too. Oh, okay. um, and then there's Johan Michelson, who started the whole cowboy hat craze, and he's, he's just a whale of a turner. Nice guy too. But uh, basically, uh, cowboy hats turn the very same way as a lampshade. They're both real thin, and, and I've turned both of them. But... Uh, the trick is just using a light, as you'll see here in a minute. Um, I've turned thin things in the past. Here's a bird feeder. Um, I made bird feeders that had a uh, like a uh, bowl that went down skinny and then flared out into a seed tray. And I drilled holes around the base of the bowl so the seeds would pour out into the tray. And this was one of the lids that had a rope running right down through the middle. And you could raise this up, pour seeds in, and then let it down so the seeds didn't get wet. And um, I had one crack, and I, and I just wanted to know, is this cracking because I, I have too much wood thickness somewhere along the way? So I just ran it through my bandsaw. It was already ruined. But I encourage you when you're trying to turn lampshades or you're trying to turn it thin, just to check yourself. If you ruin one, no big deal. Just cut it in half and just check. Am I getting a good uniform wall thickness? You know, am I quivering? And, you know, do I have thin spots? You'll be able to see them if they're too thin. Super glue it, paint it, hang it on walls. Sure, but I, I encourage you when you're practicing and you don't care how it turns out, cut your work in half. You know, you got a bowl you played with, just cut it in half. Like Charlie had a question, should I turn that thinner or should I, you know, what about the base, that kind of questions. 
cut your work in half. If you don't really care about it, if you don't really want to keep it, you learn a great deal from, from looking at what you do in terms of thickness. And this was freehand turned without a laser dot. So I, I did learn that I didn't do anything wrong, except I turned green spruce and I brought it into a shop with a wood stove going. It was 85 in there. That's, that's what went wrong. So this one yesterday, I, I put linseed oil on it with a brush inside and out, and I put it in a plastic bag overnight. My shop's real warm and the wood heat's going. So it hasn't cracked yet. It may. I don't know. But I'm going to keep putting oil on that one. I think it's a decent shade for a little wall lamp. Okay. So hopefully you can see what I'm seeing when I hollow here. And I roughed this out ahead of time. All I did was put one center of the lathe in more or less in the middle on each end, turn the lathe on at low speed, because this is out of balance, and I basically just turned it into this shape that you see here. I had one live center in that hole, and the other end I had a drive center in. And I, and I made a uh, tenon, or protrusion, sticking out that would fit the jaws of my chuck. So that's what was been done to go from here to here, okay? Now I know when I stick it in there and I tighten up my chuck, it may not run perfectly true, so I've got the lathe set nice and slow, stand out of the way, turn it on, you can see it's quivering a little bit right there. I can take the time to loosen the jaws and maybe move it a little and re-tighten them and I might be able to get it perfect, but I think we're just going to go ahead and turn it smooth again, the outside, and we'll get started on the inside. Did you use uh, your center to uh, try and put it in the chuck center? Uh, my live center here? Yeah. yeah, I could. That would help. I just did it right here a few minutes ago. Yeah. I put the chuck on top and tightened it just with gravity. I didn't take any pains, but I'm going to put the tail stock up just for safety. And the, the tool that I like the most going from a block like this to this is called a roughing gouge. This is a roughing gouge. That's what it looks like in cross section. There's a lot of cutting surface area. It's made for roughing out. <laughs> That's when it was, I think, that long when it was new, so it's, it's been shortened a lot by grinding it. But roughing gouges are underrated for long tapers and for spindle you know, work, like baseball bats, turning a baseball bat. This is the tool I really like for that. Now, or how do you hold that? Do you just hold it uh, level and, and, and just take off chunks of wood? Or do you, yeah, if you, bevel, or what if do you, you hold it level, you can use the very middle to cut off wood. And uh, if you lower the handle, you can rub the bevel oh. on the turning wood. But it's kind of hard to rub a bevel when you got an irregular surface until you get it round. How are you going to use it now? Can't really do that. Now I'm going to lower the handle a little bit and rub the bevel on the work. Up. And I'm actually not going to cut right in the middle. I'm going to cut slightly on the right hand, my right hand, uphill edge. That's important. That way when the wood's coming around, it's slicing it at an angle. And it, it's going to give me a smoother cut. If I cut right in the middle, I'd be doing a peeling cut. But if I move off to the right just a little bit, going downhill, it'll be more of a shearing cut. And this project, for those of you that don't turn a lot or just learning, um, it is a spindle turning because the grain is running the length of the lathe. So you gotta let the camera see. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is our piece of wood, basically. That's what's inside the chuck that you can't see. And all the fibers are like straw or celery. They're all lined up this way in the piece. So if I turn my cut that way, I'm cutting downhill with respect to these fibers. So as I'm cutting this fiber, this one's supporting it. It's longer. Okay? Now when I come to do the inside, when I hollow this thing out like that, Cutting downhill will actually be cutting this way. And that makes it a little tougher because I have to cut on a pulling cut. You can do that with a gouge. You also can do it with a scraper. You also can do it with a hook tool. I'm going to use all three today. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as I go. But that's important to know which way the grain is running in your piece and cutting downhill with respect to the grain. Okay? If this piece was in here the other way where the grain is crossways, it would be just the opposite directions we cut. If it's a cross grain piece, like normal bowls, a lot of bowls are. Does that make sense to everybody? Is that part of the reason why you get kickback? You get grabs and you tear chunks out if you're cutting against the grain. It's a lot more sanding. I don't want to make a comment on this. We're, 
tossing around a lot of things that a lot of us here understand, like rubbing the bevel and downhill. And Steve is a great teacher. For the people that are new at this, um, I'd encourage you to stick with us. And we'll, we're going to show you, all as time goes on, how to do all of this. We intend to go back to the very basics and bring you along. That, yeah. that, that is the intent. And I could tell you that five or six years ago, I came to my first meeting. Steve was the demo in that meeting. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea. I, I had laid at home, but they thought I knew something and didn't. And I, had, I made a lot of things fly in the air. Most of them missed me, some of them didn't. But I kept, kept up with it, and, and you can be the same, and if you stick with it, I, th I think we've got some of the best teachers that, that, that you could possibly get to bring you along with us. So hang in there. Some of this might be a little confusing, but yeah, in, you'll in get it. Just drawing a little picture for you, rubbing the bevel, what we're talking about is this is the portion of the tool right off the grinder where we've sharpened the, the gouge. This is the bevel right here. And we want to rub that on this surface as we're taking our peeling, our cut. If we bring that tool in like this, uh, even up here at the center, uh, we're more of a scraping cut. We're not rubbing this bevel on the surface of the wood as we're cutting it. That's how you get the catches you're talking about. That's you will, you'll, have, you'll have more tear out if you just shove a sharp point in the wood than if you're rubbing the bevel. Because the bevel holds the fibers down as you're cutting them. And it also changes the physics. It actually changes the pivot point right to there instead of back here at the tool rest. It gives you a tremendous physical leverage advantage because your pivot point is now the bevel, not the tool rest. Does that make sense? Stand aside when I first turn it on. Never know. I put this block on my big lathe. I have a huge lathe at home. Forgot to turn the lathe down yesterday. Turned it on and man. Scared me, I just shut it off quick. <clears throat> All I'm gonna do is true this up so it runs a little truer. No. Because I can't get my body over here too well. I guess I could, but I really tried. I'm somewhat ambidextrous, I'm still better right handed than left. The nuns converted me early on from left to right. Um, I'm not sure where we're getting all this vibration. I may just slow this whole thing down one speed to see if that helps. Um, some people would say, well, speed it up a speed. That might help. But <clears throat> I always try to err on the side of caution. That's still a little bit wobbly. Let's try going faster. Can't. Oh, that's better. I like that. Say one more little go at the surface here. This tool rest is a little too short to be able to go all the way across, so I had to stop and move it. And the one that I uh, showed you, I didn't do any sanding on it at all. This one's, I got some torn fibers here. I'm going to have one more chance. I was just going to ask you, if you're doing that, we know we all have to sand. What's your goal? My goal is no sanding on, on a lampshade, on a green lampshade. If you ever stick sandpaper on green wood spinning, it'll fill it right up. You're going to go through a lot of sandpaper trying to sand it anyway. And you'll probably get heat cracks from pushing real hard with clogged sandpaper. And, uh, Probably not the best interest of the project. There, we got rid of all those little torn fibers for the most part. I'll come around this side. I really think once we uh, do a little work to the bottom here, it, it'll smooth it out. Okay, got any number of tools to do the bottom with. I'm just going to use a 5 8 bowl gouge, and I have the sides ground back quite a ways on this particular gouge. And it'll come in handy inside later, having those ground away. We'll see.
running a little smoother. Okay, we're going to get rid of this support out here. When you're turning away the very middle like this, you want to move forward slowly because the wood's turning more, there's less surface speed of the wood here than there is out at the edge. The bigger you are, the faster it's actually moving by in terms of feet per second or inches per second. So as I approach the middle, I slow down. Out here I can move along pretty rapidly, but the closer I get to the middle, the more I want to just slow down and let the tool do the work, not get in a hurry, and eventually it eats its way through there. If you don't slow down, then you're hogging it, you're pushing hard on the tool, you might knock it loose from the chuck because you're pushing hard sideways. But just take your time. Um, I think, I think uh, people that have a lot of experience turning just automatically do that. And they don't even think about it. That out here we're moving along pretty quickly, and then as we go in further and further in, we just slow down. It's just second nature when you've been turning a while, just to slow down as you slow to the middle. If you do that, the tool has a chance to cut efficiently, it gets rid of its chips nicely. Even on the end grain, it produces spirals. In soft wood, you have a sharp tool. Uh, it gives good results, and you don't really end up with a lot of sand in it. The bevel rubs nicely. You can even turn away a little nubbin in the middle. And with very little tear out. Okay? I'm going to just for a minute put the tailstock back on. We're going to drill the middle out because it turns so slowly, it takes us a while to turn it away, all the wood. So this just speeds up the demo by drilling it out. You don't have to, you can turn it away. Uh, it isn't hard. You enough to do that. Huh? You may not have enough power to do that. Well, I just sharpened it, so I'm hopeful. Okay, cool. We'll see. You have to slow the lathe down to turn it pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a whole other class, how to sharpen a forester bit, too. I've got about two inches that this ramp comes out, so um, I've got to watch that I don't run it clear on out. Burning. You smell it? The other thing I notice here is as I'm doing this, I didn't do a very good sharp job of sharpening because only one side of the forester bit is actually cutting right now. So that's in my favor with this small lathe with lack of power, that it's not actually cutting on both sides. years of hard use and they've been sharpened dozens of times so I've probably lost the geometry. I know they cut smaller holes now. Than they do. You don't really want to get the bit stuck in here by failing to clean it out or the lathe will probably smoke the belt, scare you a little. James Johnson invented a wonderful tool that clamps in here with a with a taper, it's got a big lever, and you just push it in and pull it out and it <laughs> cleans the hole out. It's a wonderful tool. He does hollowings this deep, so he's got to get that drilled out. And uh, it's a pleasure just to watch him drill it out. So imagine if you were drilling four feet deep, how many times you'd have to go in and out with this thing. Clean it out. You know. Those of you that are uh, purchasing lathes, uh, you're buying your first lathe or you're buying a better lathe, this is what you pay the money for, guys. Is you pay the money for the machining of that taper, you pay the money for the flatness of the bed, the alignment, 
of the tail stock with the with the head stock. The better lathes, like a nice jet like this that you pay the money for, those things are well machined. And so when you're in here boring, if this thing starts to slip in the taper, it's going to bark that up inside. You don't want that to happen. And so you may even want to grab this with a set of channel locks to make sure it doesn't spin. If you're in really deep and you're building up shavings, I've had them spin in the, in the tapers before. This is a Morris taper here, and it crams into the hole. And it's just that friction that keeps it from slipping. So the deeper you bore, watch out for your tapers. Make sure they're clean when you put them together. All right. So we've gotten rid of the middle. That just will speed up our hollowing. And we can choose any number of tools to get hog away a lot of this wood. Um, many of you, when you first start out, will find it more comfortable to scrape. This is a metal lathe bit in a metal handle with a long handle for leverage. And I can use this rounded tip just to scrape away wood. It will really peel the wood off nicely. It leaves a torn surface because I'm scraping, especially in soft, wet wood like this. But it's effective, it's cheap, and you can go to the hardware store and buy yourself a steel rod like this for a couple bucks. Bore a hole in the end, put an Allen screw, shove a little metal bit in there, and you've got a really nice hollowing tool. This one's made out of a star drill that you beat with a hammer and cut through cement blocks. I found it at a garage sale. It's hexagon, it's forged, it's a little stronger than round steel. And uh, it just worked really well for me because it's nice and long too. So I can go in with a scraper, and just cut sideways. I can cut straight in pretty much any direction you want to go with a scraper, back and forth. And it will effectively do that job, okay? You can waste it away. My other choice is a bowl gouge. Nobody says how big they should be or how small, but obviously bigger ones will remove more stock quickly. Little ones, the fluid isn't as large to get rid of the chips, so it'll be a little slower process with a smaller one. If you're working on a little lathe like the one in the uh, bucket over there, the Carbitec, probably that's the biggest one you could use for horsepower reasons. You just It takes a certain amount of power to Peel. So a bowl gouge can be put in here. It will, it will waste away that wood pretty quickly. Now could I cut straight in? Yes, I could. But it's asking, it's much easier to take the fibers off going sideways in a peeling cut than it is straight in the fibers. Uh, it also dulls the tool quicker going straight in. So cutting sideways. What you're actually seeing is the nose of the tool. I'm actually rubbing the bevel on that cut surface. So I've got good, good control of the tool. Okay, so the bevel's rubbing. I'm transmitting a lot of that control of the tool right to just keeping that bevel rubbing as I come in. I took my hand away to show you that once it's in the cut and it's advancing, that it really doesn't require a lot of uh, effort on your part to keep the tool there. work thin like these lampshades, I like to work about an inch at a time and never go back. So when I'm hollowing this thing out, I'm going to work about an inch and get it to my final thickness, then I'm going to work another inch and get it to my final thickness and so on. And if you ever go back out there and try to touch it, it's probably too thin. It's going to flex when you're pushing against it with a tool and probably have a massive grab and there'll be pieces of lampshade around your shop. So my goal is to thin out about an inch here and then get the final wall thickness I'm after and then go another inch and do it. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm going to take it down to about a quarter of an inch. have to go an inch at a time, you can go half inch at a time if you want to. Um, but basically that's it. Now I'm going to 
This is a challenge for my photographer here. I'm going to move my light around. Hopefully, when I get to my thickness, you'll be able to start seeing the light come through. I'm cutting against the grain with this tool. If I roll it over and cut with the bottom edge, I could do a pulling cut toward me. But I might hit the handle on here. There's a pulling cut coming toward me. See it good. It helps you turn your shaft lights out too. Okay. So you're welcome to shut them off if you want. No, you can still see it good. You see yeah, all right? Okay. Well, we're starting to see a little light coming through there. And I'm at about three credit cards in thickness. So I'm under a quarter inch, but I'm a little more than um, an eighth. Between an eighth and a quarter. Three sixteenths is what I would guess I'm at right now. And I think I took this one down to a little under 316. So that's what we're going to go for. There's another tool that's very helpful. And a long time ago, 10 years ago at least, I had a gentleman here from Texas. and His name was Raul Pena. Very good turner. And he gave a demonstration on how to make hook tools by taking a piece of uh, oil hardening drill rod come soft and we bent these little hooks and we sharpened them and he showed everybody in my shop down here how to use them before we had a turning club. Right. It was a long time ago. We even heat treated them and, and that's quite a process. But this is one of uh, the, the hooks that I've made and a hook tool, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the little dolls in Poland and Russia that all fit one inside the other. They're, exactly. they're wood. They're called matryoshka and they're made out of boxwood and they're they're turned, or linden tree, and they're turned uh, in mass quantities. Believe it or not, the only thing that holds that wood on the lathe in Russia is they have a very large block of steel on the headstock with a hole drilled in it, about that big around, and they turn the, the wood blanks and they hammer it in there with a big sledgehammer. It's, it's called a cup chuck, and that's what they use for matryoshkas. They ju it's just held by friction. And they hollow those little, the little ladies men, ladies, they're painted up in different colors mm -hmm. with a hook tool. It doesn't require much horsepower and they cut on the pull and they and I will be cutting downhill with this tool. And it, it really lets you, it's very uh, easy to control. You see the light shining through now? Yeah. The light's always going to shine through better through end grain, which is what this really is end grain. And when I get up in here, the light's not going to shine through as well because it's more side grain. So it kind of fools you as far as thickness. So if you cut this in half, if you had the same amount of light transmission through that whole thing, right up in here you'd actually be a little thinner than you think you are. Because it doesn't shine through quite as much here as it does out here, especially in this bell shape. Okay? So you got to be aware of that. But that's probably about as thin as I want to go. It's uh, just over an eighth of an inch. And if you want to decorate with uh, something like this little dragonfly in there, you might want to leave just a little more thickness so you've got something to work with if you're going to decorate. All right. So the next step is just to get in there a little deeper and run the next inch. And I like to keep everything wet. So this dries out a lot as it's spinning and it gets thin. It really dries out quickly just from centrifugal force. Just water. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of a knot or something on the very edge. Is that going to be a problem? Right out here? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little what's left of a knot. Um, for demo, I'm not going to worry about it. If it was a real birdhouse or a shade, I might cut it off back to here, get rid of that flaw. It might be an interesting flaw when the light's on it. Yeah. Let's see. See, is it looking different with light? Yeah, how about yeah. that? But it's not likely to come flying apart. I hope not. If it gets, it'll only get you, okay? Okay. <laughs> about, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think it'll go anywhere.
Everybody see okay? What I'm up to? It's a process of an inch at a time, just getting rid of the bulk of the wood first, and then uh, slowly the rest of it. And I'll sharp this. One. Notice the sound is changing a little, it's getting higher pitched. That's a clue as to how thin you are also. You get real thin, it starts to screech, and uh, you'll know if you're really thin. I'm only going out to where I left off. I'm not coming all the way out to the rim because it's too weak now. So, the goal is just to uh, stop right there. See how we're doing. What do you think? It looks good. Yeah. About the same. You can really tell, and you can run your fingers or a caliper and feel. It's, it's very subtle what the light does for you uh, and how accurate you can be with thickness just based on the color. If I had any delay in this, the phone rings, somebody shows up, I'd bag it. Put a bag over it. Maybe a handful of wet shavings, throw them in there. All right. So here we go again. This tool rest, uh, I like to put it on an angle so I've got my support close. And this is getting kind of short because this is almost ready to start hitting down here. So I'm going to switch to a longer one. That's another advantage to drilling that center hole. It gives you a place to put your end of the tool rest. <coughs> Questions? How are we doing? Good. Self explanatory? Simple. Simple, right? strength. It lets you hog a little better if that core is in there, but drilling it out speeds it up. Uh, I don't know, I suppose the time you save hogging, you lose drilling, so it's about the same. But, uh, doesn't have to be a lamp We could have turned the outside of a cowboy hat first. And we could be inside a cowboy hat, hollowing it out very, very thin like this. And when you're done with that, you put a rubber band around it and the rims will actually come up. They're flexible enough. Um, you can turn a really remarkably nice cowboy hat that way. in the two colors, but you can kind of tell where, where I left off last time. You Showing see up about an well. inch in there where it's kind of golden color, and then out here it's more straw color where I've, I'm at my final thickness. Um, these hook tools are wonderful for that last little bit, and to sharpen them you have your choice of a Dremel with a cone-shaped stone in it, or a little diamond hone which you can run both inside the curve and outside the curve and just dress it like that with a diamond. It doesn't take much to restore that edge. And you really don't want to grind these anymore than you have to because you have to make a new hook when they're ground away. But the hook tool is mighty nice. You cut a little downhill with it. It's a pulling cut and by rotating it, it, it uh, will rub the bevel on the outside of the hook. So it is a very controlled cut. Doing. Not so bad. 
feels pretty good, about the same. The light's telling me I'm pretty darn close. You can see a few little torn fibers. Uh, I suppose if I took more time to sharpen, I might get rid of some of those. But we're, we're cruising here. There's a little flaw John was talking about. It turns into a design feature. <laughs> planned it that way. We planned it that way, yeah. Okay, so back to our gouge again, and we'll hog some more. Forgetting my manners here. Keep the wood happy. I really like turning green wood. I, I really don't like turning dry, dry wood. Uh, in fact, I have so many bowls turned now that are seasoning for years that were green when I turned them. I really don't want to turn them dry. Turn them, turn them, but I have to. have in our club that we built as, club, as a club together a number of years ago. They're called boring bars. And they're actually a bar that fits in a trap out here so they can't go anywhere. And they let you go in to hollow things and hollow them out safely without having to hold a tool in any way. And a child or a lady with, or a guy with not much strength can easily go in and hollow extremely thin with those tools. <laughs> with no torque on the handle, it doesn't twist in your hand, you don't need to be strong. They're very easy to make out of just round rod like this. We can weld one up in no time. And as you get deeper, if we were doing a lampshade that's this tall, you may want one of those to go deep in there and to do those final hollowings where you don't have to be so far in there with a long handle, you know, to control torque and, and leverage. So uh, if you're in, interested in deep turnings, especially uh, where you're way hanging way off the rest, way in there, that might be a tool you might want to look into uh, getting or making. And I like to make tools. Like that. that one inch uh, where it's a little thicker and the rest uh, the rest is that thickness. You can see that last inch is kind of a reddish color. Okay, so back in with this. Spin it down. side grain, not end grain. Well, side grain doesn't transmit light as well. So I'm actually, it looks like it's getting a little thicker, a little more reddish. It's actually the right thickness. So I know that, so I'm going to stop. But if I tried to make it the same light color all the way up, I'd probably be getting quite thin up in the top. really dries out as you get thinner and thinner the centrifugal force is throwing water out of the piece and the uh, nice warm lamp here is drying it so that's why I keep squirting water on it. I don't really want it to dry quickly and crack. Okay, back in. When you 
spray it with water, it tends to have this shaving stick to it. Makes it kind of heavy. And it's probably not a good idea to weight that down a lot, being so thin. So you might want to stop and clean it off. And now we'll go to skinning it up. Not happy with how this cut last time. So you want a real hard stone to run on there to shape it nicely, and uh, just make sure it doesn't have any medical metal particles embedded in the stone. And I give the exterior a quick once over. Like that, and then inside, too much coffee. That's it. It doesn't take much metal uh, to remove to uh, get a sharp edge again. It's tempting to bring that tool all the way out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's hard to make yourself not come pulling all the way out there to touch that. But that's when things fly apart when you get out here. You notice, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guess what happens when you bring a tool out there and push against that? It flexes outward, right? Then you got something flexing inward coming along behind it, and that's where the catch happens. All right, we're only going to go a little bit further for our demo today, and then I'm going to show you how to do the top. And that's where you lose a lot of these, is, is this little depression in the top. Because you really have no way of knowing how thick you are up here, up in here, from here to there. There is a thickness on top. Ideally, it should be the same as the side, so the light shines through the top the same. And if you leave a thicker portion up here, it's likely to develop a crack because of the difference in thickness. So the guys that turn cowboy hats and that turn big lamp shades, they want it the same thickness on the top. They run a rod through the tailstock. There's a boring, there's a hole through this shaft all the way in there. And they put a ball bearing that fits the inside of your spindle. And they put an automotive... 12 volt light bulb in there, like your car tail light bulb, and they run it on a 24 volt doorbell transformer. Well, when you run a 12 volt bulb at 24 volts, it's really bright and it doesn't last very long. But that way, the bulb is inside the shade and it's stuck onto a jam chuck. You jam it on, and you can literally see how thin you are working on this from the light within, even as the lathe is running. So they've got a bearing on each end and a rod with a power cord coming out. I use an 18-volt system. 18-volt, similar. And, and the ball flash. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Well, Frank Sedal's the one turned me on to the 12-volt yeah, thing years, years, yeah. years ago. Yeah, Frank's a neat guy. I miss him dearly. Okay, we're down in the bottom, and it's really tough for me now to get my gouge down in there to do this hollowing with this. It's pretty tough to rub the bevel in there. So I'm just going to switch to the good old scraper. It's uh, a low finesse tool, but it just lets me continue down the bottom. I'm going to turn this. Now we're at a point right here where this base is just about rubbing the rim. I'm in as far as I can go with that thing without hitting. So I'm going to turn it sideways just a little bit so I have a ledge to set on. And that's another reason to switch to the scraper. I've now I've got a very long tool handle that I can put under my body and I can just wiggle back and forth to, to hollow. When I use this tool, look at the length difference. <laughs> Which one's a better teeter-totter with a fat kid on the end? Hmm? You get the lesson? That's physics. So, I got Forget the first time 
I saw a deep boring. It just, I could still remember it like it was yesterday. It was in Sheboygan, Michigan, and it was in an industrial building. And I was invited to go visit a guy, <laughs> and uh, he had a monster Oliver Lay set up. And when I walked in the door, he's laying on top of a boring bar that one of those big bars that sticks out here. But his bar's about that big around, and it's about eight feet long. He's laying on top of it with a lit cigarette, and the ashes are dangling, and he's in there. And I could see what he was doing because the sides of the piece, and it was a massive piece. It was this big around and probably that deep. There were big holes in the side of the piece. And I could see his tool inside there cutting as this piece is spinning fast. And I'm watching him, and he's got this big old bar like this with a little bitty tool in the end. He's way down in the bottom doing the bottom of that big vase. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's crazy. He is. And, and there was a faceplate there that had swimming pool weights bolted to half one side of it and not the other side because the piece was all rotten and it was so out of balance that he had compensated with weights. And so he saw me out of the corner of his eye walk in. He finished doing his cut because it was his last cut, I think. And he shut the machine off. I couldn't believe how long it took to stop. It coasted forever because this big wave. And I... I introduced myself and shook his hand and I, I was blown away. I was just beside myself and I said, have you ever had one of those things come off? And he just pointed at the wall and there's a hole about that big through the metal wall. <laughs> Went out into the forest away. He goes, yeah, that was one of them. And I look up and there's holes in the ceiling and I'm thinking, this is a guy i got to learn more about. That's Gary Wiremiller back there. And uh, Gary amazes me with some of the hollowing he does still to this day. i got to spend more time with him. But this, this getting down in the bottom of things is no small matter. And it, it takes some practice. So don't be afraid if you try a few of these and they, you get way down in here, you cut too deep, and you, and you get a funnel. It's, it's simply a, a matter of losing leverage. You're hanging further off yeah. the tool rest. Yeah, it's, it's a law of physics. When you're in that far, it's not so bad. When you're in there, it's a little tougher to control what that's doing. So, lost of control. Yeah, lost of control. Hold your breath and pray. <laughs> well, we're going to pray because this is my last Halloween down in the bottom there. I should just pray one more time here. Last time, the famous last cut. You know how that works. Yeah. You ready, John? Yep. I'm ready. Okay, you're ready. I'm a baseball mitt ready. That's right. Awesome. sigh of relief when you're done with hollowing that you haven't had one fly apart yet. So I'd say that's about as good as we need to do for today's demo. It looks a little more reddish down in there, but I, again, I assure you that's side grain versus end grain. Um, that's what it looked like yesterday on the other one. So I didn't chicken out. But the last step is turning that top. I'll try to uh, move along here, respectful of your time. Up, take this out. I suppose you could try to do a little sanding, but it's probably not a good idea. There it is. And now what we need to do is we'll probably we remove all that wood right there and then some to dish in the top. And the big question is how deep do you go? So you kind of have to know where that ends, don't you? About right at that line. About right at that line. Okay. Belt. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so let's have a go at it. <coughs> this chuck I've never lost anything out of. It's an old Nova, and everybody snickers when they see them. But uh, it, it's got real deep jaws with serrations, and they're dovetailed. I've never ever had anything come out of this, and I've had stuff that long and that big around out there on the end with no steady. So I trust it. Okay, here's just a lump of cedar on a face plate. This is a homemade face plate with a nut welded to a plate. Um, I probably have 20 of these in my shop so that I have plenty of face plates. And it's a good heavy piece of steel plate. So it doesn't flex or bend. If you're going to make your own, you, you really don't want uh, movement. 
of the plate, so use heavy plate. Did you have to reface the plate after the weld or not? They, they did it at the shop where okay. they welded them. Yeah, for me. that's what I found. You have to reface it. Okay, um, I'm just going to true this up. I'm not going to take much wood off. Actually, my, my homemade faceplate is doing me a disservice right here. At home, I have a washer. Um, my nut bottoms out without hitting the shoulder here. So it's not really running true like a, at home. It would true itself if I ran it all the way in against the washer. But I will just true it up. There, that's pretty good. If you're going to touch something spinning, it's probably smarter to touch it down here because it's going away from you. Touch it here and bang your fingers into your body. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we are. Sort of sticks. What's going to happen if I push real hard here? I'll probably split it out, right? So any pressure that I apply to keep it there, I want to be minimal pressure with the tailstock. I don't really want to crank it down hard. But I, I like the fact that it's somewhat sticky on its own. It means that this taper right here and this taper right here are kind of close. Or, or it wouldn't be sticky like that. Or it's sticking on a high spot up here. Either way, I don't really care. I just want it to stick. Because in the long run, I'm going to take away this live center completely and want to do a little bit of turning there right at the end without this. And that's how you get that little final little nubbin in the very middle when you're done. Okay? Now, if you have a, a dent in the middle, sometimes you can get it to go right back in the same hole. That one's wandering. Oh boy. So we can move it a little. How many times do you need to play around with this to get it right? As many as it takes. <laughs> It's subtle little movements like that. And if you can't tell which way it has to go, you can cheat. You can spin it. And barely touch it. And that will tell you that's sticking out the furthest right there. Okay. So you can loosen up just a little bit. Try to get we got her. So now it's running quite true. I've got very minimal pressure here. And I'll come around now and remove this wood. And it, it looked like the, the very middle bottom is right about at that shoulder where the chuck jaws bottomed up. So that's as deep as it's hollow. So that's, that's where we're aiming for a little higher than that. About halfway between the shoulder and the blue line is going to be the top of this thing. Okay, we'll start wasting away the top. I could have a rounded top on it, right? That'd be kind of cool. Go for that. You want a dish? Here, dish, dish, dish. that's what the bottom of the thing is doing, it's actually a bell inside too. So if I stay with this, I can, uh, you guys hear the sound that's making? But I'm on the side out here where I know it's thin. If I come in, it sounds a little thicker right in there. I'm going to do something here. Yeah. Well, we're going to take this thing off.
I have a quick question. We're going to check and see what we can see. It looks quite thick right in this whole area mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I notice most of the time as you're preparing to move the, the tool rest, you turn the spindle on first. Is there a reason for that? I just lose track. Um, technically, you should have a lathe off when you move the tool rest so you don't hit it, anything spinning. I would say that'd be my Yeah, I just... My luck. I'd, yeah. I, I've hit it a lot, yeah. but uh, I don't know. Make an awful noise. When I was first starting to turn, I always was freaked out because I was going to lose a piece if I messed it up. I don't care now. I've ruined too many. I've had too many in the wood stove. I really don't care if I ruin a piece unless it's a big, beautiful piece I have a lot of time in. Eight hours of hollowing or something in a boring bar. Um, or it's an exquisite piece of spalted bird's eye that, you know, is irreplaceable. I'll make darn sure everything clears before I turn it on. I get real... A little bit paranoid. Then. The expletives diminish over the years for two reasons. You get better and you make fewer mistakes and you care less. <laughs> yeah, I've just had so I've done it before. I've ruined too many things. So we know we have something to go here. Let's go it. The switch to a smaller, lighter, shorter tool since the rest is so close. I don't need those big long handles for leverage. I'd have to swing my arm way around. This way I can make small movements. Sometimes sound will give you a clue. Listen carefully. thicker there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that fools you too. <laughs> but it's worth a try. Still got a fair amount of wood right in there. And I can't see any, oh, I see a little glow next to the button right there. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Sometimes the water helps too. Makes it more uh, light, more light transmission. Can you see any of that? See a tiny little glow right there. But I definitely have more to remove right in this area. It's all right, we have an editor. It's all right. We, we can edit that out. Huh? Yeah. This uh, live center has like a little ring around the post in the middle, and I see a mark from that little ring. So that's how I'm able to, to get it back in the center hole or close. All right, here we go. Hold your breath. You ready, John? How far is too far? I like that sound. My wife can't believe I can hear that because I can't hear pick up your shorts. No, no problem with that. So, she's amazed that I can hear wood, but I can't hear around the house stuff. Bit of a glow there still, but we still got a fair amount of wood up in there. Feels like just feeling like a quarter inch. Important so, because if it, you're going to put this in linseed oil, right? Yeah. And then do you put it in a paper bag or what? I just throw it in a plastic bag and linseed oil. Plastic bag. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if it's going to crack, it's going to crack in the thickest spot. Yeah, if there's a difference in thickness, that's where it'll crack, where it's thicker. The wood moves more when there's more wood there to, to shrink and swell. Yeah. That's why I cut this in half to see, did I leave something extra thick? And uh, it's kind of interesting to me, the cracks formed out here, not up here where it was thicker. Well, but again, you, this is wood stove. You did know. you drill a hole before? Yeah. In the top? Mm -hmm. That's why it didn't crack there. You yeah. relieved hole went all the way up through. So you relieved the pressure. Yeah. Pressure was relieved. But, uh, Why aren't you going to drill a hole on the top of this one too? Could. Lamp shape? We could. Or we could just put in one of these. Okay. It'd be nice to drill a hole, let the heat out, wouldn't it? Or a series of holes like I did over there. So we can just turn a hole, right? We could. <coughs> Couldn't we? Yeah. If we wanted to. So, so if I accidentally turn through this, you'll know that's what I had planned. By the way. <laughs> right? Was it, it's a design opportunity, according to Craig Sadal. I'm using a pulling cut there for a minute on the side and then I'm going back to a pushing here. Now that's starting to sound thin. I'm never embarrassed to stop and check, pull something off and look to check. And, uh, getting close, aren't we? You guys see the glow? Yeah. All right. One more chance to really screw this up. One more coming. It looked like a lot, but that was about the thickness of a credit card, what I just took off. Um, so, let's see. A little more yet? No. Oh, you gotta live, live like Florida. You gotta try. You gotta try to get the blow. How far do you press in a demo? As far as you dare. Right? And as your skills as a turner improve, mine still are, your ability to cut a smooth flowing curve without notches and flats improves because your your speed at which your this hand moves away from your body or the speed that you shift your weight from one foot to the other it gets smoother with practice and uh, that's what gives you the shapes is your movement so I know that's done I could just tell not too bad does it have to split more or less because you're off the center of the log itself? It would help if the center of the tree was right in the center. That would be really nice. It would probably have equal force. But this tree grew on my beach, and I get a lot of wind. So the center of the log was not in the center of the tree, because it had developed more tissue on the windward side to resist bending. You'll see that on trees that grow on hills, too. The uphill side always has and that's wider fruit. That's rings. Fruit, right? Yeah. Hmm? Spruce, yeah. Okay. It's called the ashen wood. I think we'll have one more go. He's determined to self destruct this. I'm going to push it here because I've already got a useful lampshade. Or two. 
And I've got, still got a sharp tool that seems to be cutting pretty well. So, oh, I had it centered. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to smooth that transition with a pull cut first. Okay, last try. Sometimes you just have to go for it. We're there? Or should we do one more? I was nervous two cuts ago. <laughs> you were nervous two cuts ago. <laughs> well, I think we can do one more. I think we'll do one more. Okay, now I'm not going to take it off because I'm done cutting at this point. I'm not going to do another one. But I am going to try to turn away that nubbin in the middle. And again, when you uh, are talking about cutting downhill, this is where it gets real important cutting downhill, that nubbin. So when you um, do this, I'm going to draw, draw this extra large. Here's the top of the bell, the very top. And here's our little nubbin. And here's my, my center on my lathe right here. The grains are running this way, all the fibers. I am, I'm actually going to sneak up on it and, and cut it into a V. I'm going to start here with a V and make my V a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper. And eventually that will snap off right there. And then I'm going to turn away this little bit blast when it's stuck on there with no support. Okay? And you guys can do this on your bowls too. If you have a nice jam fit on something or a vacuum chuck or whatever, you can uh, turn away on the bowls the same way. So, now there's not a whole lot of strength right here, right? So if I really get aggressive cutting that nubbin <coughs> off, I could have it fracture out because it just doesn't have the strength to hold itself. So as I develop that V, I'm going very easy. Cutting downhill, both ways. Questions to you about what tool you're using back here? I'm using a spindle gouge, and it's ground to a really pointed point. And I've got the sides removed on both sides quite a ways back. So it can reach into tight places without hitting the sides of the tool. Could you use a part? I could use a skew, chisel, if I was good with one. Uh, I'm not so good with one. I also, I also could chicken out and take a little saw and saw it off. We all want to know why you're not Parting tool, it has a lot of drag. And I didn't bring my really narrow little knife edge one uh, with me. But you could. You know, you could leave this little thing in the middle as a design too, a little uh, finial, and then drill some little holes around to let the heat out. But, could do that. That's why I like wood turning. Nobody tells me what it should look like. Even right up to the end, I have design chances to change my idea. I've got flexibility and creativity. Uh, in my former career as a teacher, I didn't have that flexibility. I mean, I, I had classroom flexibility in what I, how I could teach, but I taught medical lab, and there wasn't room for creativity in a medical lab. <laughs> why not? Uh, none. So that's why it would appeal to me so much. So I could come home, relax, do something creative. Now you're going to notice in any second now, I'm going to whittle this down a little more, this is going to stop turning because I've severed the fibers. I've whittled it down to nothing.
the stock. There's a the little end. It's kind of a nice little Kaiser's helmet knob on there, isn't it? I like that. Now, what's pulling that on there? Just that friction, right? So, if I reach around this with my hand and just steady it as I whittle that down, little fine cuts. I don't want to rub hard on it either. Just want to steady it. If I press hard, my hand would get hot. My hand's not even warm. It's just letting it run through my fingers. How far is too far here? How do you know? Anybody's guess, right? If I had a light inside, it'd be easy. But oh, we're pretty close. Hell of a guy.